Friends, the hour has arrived. Thank you for being here. Grateful to see all of you, and by see all of you, I mean see none of you. But I know there are people here. Uh, very glad to welcome you to this Maxwell Institute guest lecture by Dr. Adam Miller. My name is Spencer Fluman. I'm the executive director of the Neele Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship here at BYU. And uh, we are pleased to see so many of you here. We have repented of our error of holding the last guest lecture for Dr. Miller in far too small a venue. We learned our lesson and we are glad to be here uh, together. We're going to begin today's event with an opening prayer. And uh, I've asked Dr. Catherine Taylor uh, to give that opening prayer. Uh, this coming fall, she joins the Maxwell Institute as the Hugh Nibley postdoctoral fellow. So we are grateful for her today. Thanks. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful this beautiful morning to be gathered together in community. We are grateful for the opportunities that we are afforded to expand in love and devotion to thee, our hearts and minds. Father, we are grateful for Dr. Miller and for his thoughtful work. Please help us to receive the message and the uh, careful attention that he has put into his work today, that he may be filled with calm and thy love. Father, bless us this day as we move throughout it, that we can be blessed with thy spirit, that we can continue to walk in thy path. We love thee, and we are so grateful, again, for all that we are blessed with. Help us to be mindful and generous to all around us. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I introduce Dr. Miller, I've got a couple of items for your attention uh, this morning. First, would you take this opportunity to silence your cell phones or other devices that might be distracting? Secondly, uh, right before you do that, would you follow us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook? What did I miss, Blair? Snapchat? I tried that and it was a failed experience. It didn't work. Blair couldn't figure out Snapchat. He's like 24, so he was way too old to figure out Snapchat. They have an age limit there. But those other venues, social media-wise, please follow us. Please, uh, please keep up to date with uh, what's happening at the Maxwell Institute. We've got a lot of great things coming. Speaking of which, I don't want to leave an opportunity uh, to tell you about next week's phenomenal uh, event at the Maxwell Institute. If you love Adam Miller, you'll love our Maxwell Institute symposium entitled Forgiveness and Reconciliation. We're pleased to welcome M. Poe Tutu Van Firth, Joseph Severenzi, Lisa Faulkner Byrne, and our own D3 Nicole Green. All of these uh, folks have thought deeply about forgiveness and reconciliation and what that looks like in contexts like Rwanda and South Africa and Northern Ireland. Ireland. So they'll examine uh, forgiveness and reconciliation from diverse contexts, different angles of vision. It should be a marvelous time next week. So here are the, the key details for that event. That will be Wednesday, May 30th, from 2 to 5 p.m. at the BYU Library Auditorium. That's the uh, auditorium downstairs in that newer edition. So we, we hope you can join us then for what should be memorable presentations. Lastly, uh, let me note that uh, Dr. Miller's address today comes from a forthcoming book, uh, An Early Resurrection, Life in Christ Before You Die, uh, co-published by the Neil A. Maxwell Institute and Deseret Book. Uh, those, there are copies for sale for you just outside the Varsity Theater here. This book does not release till July. So yeah, th these are pre-publication Copies. This is what this is. I, I'm just inventing a tradition. This is a Maxwell Institute exclusive. 
today that you get uh, you get to purchase copies before your friends make them feel terrible about missing the event. Yeah, flash that copy before them. So, well, you can wait till July and get one. <laughs> now on to Dr. Miller. We're, we're grateful to have uh, Dr. Miller back with us. He's a professor of philosophy at Collin College in McKinney, Texas. He earned a BA in comparative literature at BYU and an MA and PhD in philosophy from Villanova University. He's the author of several books, including Speculative Grace, Future Mormon, and The Gospel According to David Foster Wallace. He directs the Mormon Theology Seminar as well. Uh, we're grateful to have him. Uh, at the Maxwell Institute, our, our key mission, our key concern, is to support um, those scholars that we call disciple scholars, those who work at the intersection of scholarship on religion and the disciplined practice of the faith. And uh, Dr. Miller, in my mind, is a quintessential disciple scholar, and we're grateful to have you with us today. Please welcome him. to BYU for hosting us and for the Maxwell Institute for uh, inviting me to come and speak. Uh, I love the Maxwell Institute. Uh, I love the idea of supporting disciple scholars. I love trying to be one uh, and I love Spencer Fluman for uh, supporting that mission. Um, because you're here today, you're obviously familiar with that moment that happened a Monday evening during family business when looking at the calendar for the week you thought to yourself there's not really anything going on at 11 a.m. on Thursday morning can we find a philosopher in town? Are there any philosophers in town? and lucky for you here we are congratulations this is this is what you picked. Um, this book, I'm mostly going to, uh, my remarks are going to be uh, geared around touching on some of the main themes in uh, the book that Spencer mentioned, An Early Resurrection, Life in Christ Before You Die. Um, this is a book that, uh, in many ways, I've spent 20 years writing. Uh, it's a book that, in my mind, distills both 20 years worth of scholarship and 20 years worth of practical effort at trying to do what we talk about at church down into one teeny tiny very concentrated package. As a result I feel depending on the day when I reread the book sometimes I feel like I really nailed it uh, and that this book this book really captures for me so much of what uh, has mattered most uh, in my own life and in my scholarship over that period. Uh, and some days I read the book and I think, there is no way that this captures even a part <laughs> of what has mattered most to me uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, but I hope that there's something in it, that there's something in it for you that you can find useful. Let's... Uh, See if we can move on from that slide as soon as possible. <laughs> for decades now, for as long as I can remember, I've been locked in the loop of a deep lie, a fundamental fantasy that my stuttering mind has repeated to itself over and over ad nauseum in an attempt to convince someone, anyone, perhaps especially myself, that it was true. This deep lie, this primal fiction, is the lie that my life is about me, or at least that my life ought to be 
about me, or even that my life could be about me. But it's not true. My life is not and cannot be about me. I will never catch up to myself, never coincide with myself, never own myself. And though my mind still repeats this bald-faced lie to itself more or less incessantly, especially when Spencer stands up here and says nice things about me, regardless of what's happening, the lie, this is about you, this is about you, uh, nonetheless, I find myself believing that lie less and less. The shine has worn off. The edges are frayed. The sun has come out, and what had seemed like a good disguise last night looks ridiculous in the full light of day. The plain truth is that I am not my own. Even the simplest, most ordinary things hammer this home. Every breath I borrow, every sensation I feel but didn't choose, every thought that I think but didn't ask for, belies it. I am not my own, I cannot be my own, I will never be my own. On the face of it, this seems like bad news. All of my goals, all of my projects, all of my plans to arrange the world and the people in it just the way I want it. All of my schemes, honorable and dishonorable, to get what I wanted to get and to be who I wanted to be, all these will fail. I am never going to get what I wanted. I am never going to be who I wanted. The only thing that props up this fantasy, the only thing that generates even an illusion of viability for this original sin, is time. The persistence of this deep lie depends on my mishandling time. It depends on my using time to cheat the obvious truth. I may not be my own, life may force me to admit, but I tell myself, that doesn't mean that someday, maybe far in the future, I won't be. Borrowing on the future. I can cheat the obvious truth of what it means to be human. <coughs> Working on credit, I can project a fictional moment of triumph into the future, and then, organizing, and then organize my life around a series of schemes to bring that fantasy about. In short, I can cheat the truth by stalling for time, by deferring payment, by postponing the moment of reckoning. And in that gap between the present and the future, I can play a sad and painful game of make-believe. I can pretend, in my pursuit of wealth, or power, or fame, or pleasure, or distraction, I can pretend that my life is about me. If you're much like me, and I'm sorry to say that in this respect you probably are, then you are familiar with this game of make-believe. You've been playing it all day. It's organized your whole week. It's kept you up at night for years. But you don't have to live this way. If you've got the stomach to hear it, I've got good news for you. The good news is that this supposedly bad news is actually the gospel of Jesus Christ itself. The good news of the gospel is that I am not my own. That my life cannot be about me. And that regardless of my wheel-spinning machinations, I can never, ever, worlds without end, belong to myself. The good news is that I don't have to spend my life looking for flattering props and playing make-believe. I don't have to spend my life stalling for time. I don't have to spend my life deferring the future. I don't have to live on existential credit. I don't have to spend my life postponing my redemption. Rather than pretending to be my own, I can be, as in fact I already am, Christ. And rather than holding out for some fictional brand of future salvation, I can live that new life in Christ, that already redeemed life, here and now. To start this new life in Christ and break with that deep lie, these are the magic words, borrowed here from Marcus Aurelius, that you will need to say. Think of yourself as dead. You have lived your life. Now take what's left and live it properly. Think of yourself as dead. This is your new mantra. Uh, but you might protest, 
I'm not dead yet. <laughs> this is a minor technicality. <laughs> because in Christ, it's possible to die while you're still alive. And having died early, it's possible for your resurrection to begin before you've even left this world. In Christ, time's grip loosens, uh, and things start happening out of order. This is what a Christian life looks like. You're born, you're buried with Christ, your resurrection begins, and then you die. If Christ has his way, we'll all die before we're dead, and every one of us will yield our lives here and now to an early resurrection. If I keep this promise at arm's length, it's because I'm afraid. I don't want to die. I don't want to give up my life. I love my fantasies of self-possession. But this, as Paul describes it in Galatians 2, is how redemption works. Quote, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what I promised when I was baptized. This is what I promised in the temple. This is what I promise again each week with the sacrament. I promise to turn my life over to God, to consecrate the whole of it, and I promise to do so now, not later. I promise to let go of my own life and my own name and take his name upon me. I promise to always remember him. I promise to think what he would think and to say what he would say and to do what he would do. I promise to pray for his will to be done, not mine. I promise to be part of the body of Christ. I promise to let the light and life of his resurrection shine in me. In this sense, resurrection isn't only for the next life. It's meant all the more for my troubled present. If I insist on postponing my death, then I also insist on postponing my redemption. But if I am willing to let my claim to my own life die now, long before my body fails, hopefully, and my heart stops, then Christ's resurrection can also begin to take hold of my body now. I can share in Christ's life in this world and in this flesh. I accomplish this ritually by way of baptism. Paul's description of baptism in Romans 6 may be the best in all of Scripture. Rather than describing baptism as an act of ritual cleansing, as we default to doing at every baptismal service, he describes it, scarily perhaps, as a death and a resurrection. I am buried in the water and then raised from the death into a new life. Here's the whole of his description from Romans 6. Quote, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. End quote. Paul has no hope in anything but Christ. There's no hope here that with a little more time I could set my own life in order, belong to myself, and get out from under the power of sin. Entangled in my fantasies, there's only one exit, death. He that is dead is freed from sin, Paul says. If death is the only way out of sin, then let's get death over with. Instead of postponing my death and delaying the inevitable, baptism allows that death to arrive early. Burying me in a watery grave, baptism allows me to die with Christ while I'm still alive. And then having already crossed death's threshold, my resurrection in Christ can begin before my own life has ended. In this way, oh, I forgot to give you that slide. That would have been good. 
There it is, you heard it. In this way, though, baptism is a time machine. Uh, it's a vehicle for atonement. Baptism is a ritual engine for reordering my experience of time and reformatting that experience in a fundamental way. It shuffles Christ's resurrected future into my mortal present, and in doing so frees me from my sinful past. It takes a life that cannot be my own, and by dying early, willingly deeds it to Christ. Holding my death into the present may or may not help me to get ahead in life. To be fair, life in Christ is not a useful way to live if I'm bent on earning money, looking fabulous, being comfortable, winning prizes, or becoming famous. It is not a good strategy for maintaining the illusion that my life is my own. In Christ, such things may or may not come, but either way, they won't matter. And either way, I won't need them. In Christ, I will have the one thing these idols could never give. I'll be alive right now, and I won't be alone. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ is full of this kind of impractical advice, from which we habitually shy. Take no thought for your life, he says what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. In short, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, in short, think of yourself as dead. Think of tomorrow as already lost. Jesus' reason for saying this is simple. Take no thought for tomorrow because, quote, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. It's impossible to serve God and mammon. It's impossible to serve both God and mammon because I'm not capable of doing two things at the same time. I'm often not capable of one. Multitasking is a myth. I can't serve two masters. Either I can die to the present for the sake of my future, or I can die to the future for the sake of the present but I can't keep both. There's no third option. If, instead of postponing Christ, I choose to care for the present, then I leave the future in Christ's hands. I trust him with it. Trusting Christ with the law's future fulfillment, I become capable of caring now in ways that can actually help fulfill the law. Rather than worrying about life, I become capable of living it. Not worrying, I become like the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Or I become like the lilies of the field. Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. My job is simple. To stop living my life as if it were about me, to turn my life back over to God, and to do it now. My job right now is to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When I accept Christ as my master, I die early, and time's polarity gets reversed. Rather than always being attracted to the future, time becomes full, and the present becomes magnetic. Drawn by the pull of the present into the thick of time, I'm resurrected early. But when I'm absorbed in caring for this present world, time doesn't go away. Goals don't go away. Desires don't go away in Christ. The future doesn't go away in Christ. The law doesn't go away in Christ. They all remain in play. In the present, I care for time. I don't escape it. I still have desires, but now I don't put my trust in them. I still keep the law as I'm able, but I don't trust the law. I put my trust in Christ. As a matter of course, I want things because I want something from them. I want peace, I want happiness, I want love. But only Christ can offer these things, and Christ does not offer them in the way I expect. He does not offer them as a result. 
he offers them as a manner. He doesn't offer them as an end, he offers them as a means. He doesn't offer them as a noun. He offers them as a verb, or even better, an adverb. Salvation unfolds adverbially as a manner of doing what we do. Peace I leave with you, Christ says. My peace I give unto you, but not as the world giveth, give I unto you. That's John 14. Still, every day, I ask the world to give me something that it can't. I ask my wife to make me feel happy. I ask my work to make me feel loved. I ask my car or my house or my clothes to give me peace. I ask a movie or a football game or a basketball game to make my life feel exciting and meaningful. When this doesn't work, as it won't, I get bitter and I go looking for something else that might have what I want. I invest some new thing with the future hope that when I get it, it could give me what I want and make my life my own. This, though, is cruel and unfair. It's cruel because peace and happiness aren't even the kind of thing that the world, or my wife, or my car, however willing, could give. Peace and happiness simply aren't at bottom a function of the world being a certain way. They are a function of my relating to the world in a certain way. They are, better, a function of my caring for the world in a certain way. When I stop asking my goals and desires and loved ones to cough up what they cannot give, when I stop trying to wring some saving satisfaction from them, something important happens. No longer aiming through my goals, I can care for my goals. No longer aiming through my desires, I can care for my desires. No longer aiming through my loved ones at some satisfaction, I can care for my loved ones. No longer treating the law as a means to an end, as a means to salvation. I learn to love the law as an end in itself. And no longer aiming through the law at a distant future in God's presence, where I finally get what I want. I can care for the law in Christ. I can live in God's presence, as I am, right now. This is a different kind of life. This is a disciple's life. This is an already redeemed life. In Christ, I still have goals, but practicing care, I don't do the work for the sake of those goals. I do the work for Christ. I do the work for its own sake. I learn to love the work. I still have goals, but those goals don't own me. They don't control me. They don't master me. I do not pin my happiness on achieving them. Christ is my master. And then, free from the tyranny of these goals, attentive to the work, the work itself improves. I become more patient and skillful, and success becomes more likely. No longer worshipping success, I'm more likely to succeed. But even if I fail, as I consistently will, the work will have been worth doing for its own sake. This may be especially true when it comes to God's law. I've promised to live this law, but frequently I will fail. I will fail in ways that are both big and small. If I worship the law rather than Christ, if I worship the goal of succeeding in my vow to keep the law, then I'll be tempted to give up. Religion will feel like an impossible burden. I'll be angry and ashamed. But if I worship Christ rather than the law, if I love the law itself as Christ loves me, then I'll learn to love the law for its own sake. If I learn to love the law as work worth doing for its own <coughs> sake, even when I do this work imperfectly, even when I fail, then I will love it, and I will still have succeeded. If I stop treating the law as a prop for my fantasies of ownership and mastery at some future date, then I can learn to love the law and when I love the law, even trying to fulfill the law is work worth doing. Success is not the work's only measure. Life won't have been wasted. My life will, in Christ, have been saved in the very act of living it. Consider in this respect the Book of Mormon. 
What is special about the Book of Mormon? What makes it different from the Bible? In my view, the big difference between the Bible and the Book of Mormon is not what is said, but when it is said. Nephi and company are rejoicing and living in Christ long before Christ comes. And though critics love to mock it, this anachrony is, in my view, no accident. Book of Mormon prophets are, in fact, extraordinarily self-conscious about their peculiar anticipatory brand of pre-Christian Christianity. In a crucial verse in Jerem, and what may be the most important verse in the Book of Mormon, as you're probably aware, Jerem chapter 1, there's only one chapter, verse 11, Jerem claims 400 years before Christ is born that their prophets worked day and night to persuade the people to do just one thing. Quote, Wherefore the prophets and the priests and the teachers did labor diligently, exhorting with all longsuffering the people to diligence, teaching the law of Moses and the intent for which it was given, persuading them to look forward unto the Messiah and believe in him to come as though he already was. This is what's different about Nephite Christianity. They lived in Christ before Christ came. They lived Christ's future in their present. They did not postpone their deaths, and thus they did not postpone their redemption or resurrection. This is what the Book of Mormon makes plain. To live a Christian life is to live in Christ as if he were already present. As a Christian, I, like the Nephites, must learn to live as though Christ were already here. I must learn to live time out of order. I must die to the future hope of owning my own life and sacrifice that life to Christ in the present. For the Nephites, the temptation was to think that Christ only belonged to the future. For me, the temptation is to think that Christ only belongs to the past, or again, to some future world. Either way, the temptation is to think that Christ does not belong to the present. But a past or future Christ is not enough. It is not enough for me to believe in the past or future idea of Christ. To be a Christian, I have to learn to share my life with Christ now, in the present. Whether I'm waiting for Christ's first coming or his second, my job is to live in Christ as though he were already here. My job is to live right now as if I had already passed through death's veil and into the presence of God. My job is to think of myself as dead and then take what's left of my life and live it properly. My job is to live my promised redemption in the present tense. In chapter 6 of Mormonism and Early Christianity, Hugh Nibley, pictured here, offers a parable that describes what this looks like. The parable is a little bit long, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read you a good chunk of that. Quote, Imagine then a successful businessman who, responding to some slight but persistent physical discomfort and the urging of an importunate wife, pays a visit to a friend of his, a doctor. Since the man has always considered himself a fairly healthy specimen, it is with an unquiet mind that he descends the steps of the clinic with the assurance, gained after long hours of searching examination, that he has about three weeks to live. In the days that follow, this man's thinking undergoes a change not a slow and subtle change. There is no time for that, but a quick and brutal reorientation. By the time he has reached home on that fateful afternoon, the first shock of the news has worn off, and he's already beginning to see things with strange eyes. As he locks the garage door, his long-held ambition to own a Cadillac suddenly seems unspeakably puerile to him, utterly unworthy of a rational, let alone an immortal being, this leads him to the shocking realization in the hours that follow that one could be rich and successful in this world with a perfectly barren mind. With shame and alarm, he discovers that he has been making a religion of his career. In a flash of insight, he recognizes that seeming and being are two wholly different things, and on his knees discovers that only his Heavenly Father knows him as he is. Abruptly, he ceases to care particularly whether anybody thinks he is a good, able, smart, likable fellow or not. After all, 
He's not trying to sell anyone anything anymore. Things that once filled him with awe seem strangely trivial, and things which a few days before did not even exist for him now fill his consciousness. For the first time, he discovers the almost celestial beauty of the world of nature, not viewed through the glass of cameras and car windows, but as the very element in which he lives. Shapes and colors spring before his senses with a vividness and drama of which he never dreamed. The perfection of children comes to him like a sudden revelation, and he's appalled by the monstrous perversion that would debauch their minds, overstimulate their appetites, and destroy their sensibilities in unscrupulous plans of sales promotion. Everywhere he looks, he gets the feeling that all is passing away. Not just relatively, because he is saying goodbye to a world he has never seen before, but really and truly. He sees all life and stuff about him involved in a huge, ceaseless combustion, a literal and apparent process of oxidation, which is turning some things slowly, some rapidly, but all things surely to ashes. He wishes he had studied more. Pays a farewell visit to some friends at the university, where he's quick to discover with his new powers of discernment that their professional posturing and intellectual busywork is no road to discovery, but only an alley of escape from responsibility and criticism. As days pass, days during which that slight but ceaseless physical discomfort allows our moribund hero no momentary lapse into his old ways, he is visited ever more frequently by memories, memories of astonishing clarity and vividness, mostly from his childhood. The limits of time begin to melt and fuse. In a word, Nibley says, his thinking has become eschatological. Now the question arises, has this man been jerked out of reality or into it? Has he cut himself off from the real world, or has cruel necessity forced him to look in the face what he was running away from before? Is he in a dream now, or has he just awakened from one? Has he become an irresponsible child, or has he suddenly grown up? Is he the victim of vain imaginings, or has he taken the measure of vanity fair? Some will answer one way, some another. But if you want to arouse him to wrathful sermons, just try telling the man that it makes no difference which of these worlds one lives in, that they are equally real to the people who live in them. I have seen both, he will cry. Don't try to tell me that the silly escapist world of busy work, mercenary backslaps, phony slogans, and maniacal careers has anything real about it. I know it's a fake, and so do you. <coughs> That's quintessential Hugh Nibley, right there. To anyone who does not experience it, the eschatological view of things is pure myth and invention of an overwrought mind, desperately determined to support its own premises. Only what they fail to consider is that those who have had both views of the world interpret things just the other way around. It is, after all, eschatology that looks hard reality in the face. Lazy and timid people take refuge in the busy work of every day. Only strong and disciplined minds are willing to see things as they are, and even they must be forced to it. No wonder the scholars have agreed that whatever else eschatology is, it's not real. To conclude our parable, what happens to our man of affairs? A second series of tests at the hospital shows that his case was not quite what they thought it was. He may live for many years. Yet he takes the news strangely. For instead of celebrating at a nightclub or a prize fight, as any normal healthy person should, this creature will continue his difficult ways. This, he says, is no pardon. It is but a stay of execution. Soon enough, it is going to happen. The situation has not really changed at all. So he becomes religious, a hopeless case, an eschatological zealot, a Puritan, a monk, a John Bunyan, a primitive Christian, an Essene, a Latter-day Saint, end quote. I have a lot of questions. There are many things about which I am uncertain. But on this count, I am convicted. Slowly but surely, this very thing has been happening to me.
My lies are crumbling. My fantasies are failing. Time is getting pulled inside out. And my life, mercifully, is less and less my own. Something is happening to me, and as best as I can tell, it is the very thing described in our scriptures. It is the very thing that Paul calls life in Christ. It's doubtless true that I've lived an ordinary life with only ordinary failings. Even as a sinner, I am unexceptional. But it has still been hard for me to believe that Christ could, in the end, save me. It took a long time for me to believe that some kind of future with Christ was possible. If there's a minimum bar for finding forgiveness and qualifying for sainthood, I didn't see how I could meet it. For my hope in Christ to grow, I needed time. I needed to let some ideas and ambitions go. I had to learn about obedience and service and discipline. I had to learn some humility. I had to learn something about how to pray. But as I worked at this, something else happened. Christ, like a thief in the night, came when I wasn't looking. Before I was ready, he broke into the present and claimed me as his own. Christ, the life of the world, showed up unannounced in the daily living of my ordinary life. This isn't what I expected. I expected to struggle my whole life to earn a distant future with Christ. I expected to patiently curate my life for decades as some kind of winning proof that possibly, eventually, I might deserve to live in God's presence. Instead, I found Christ ready to save me. I found Christ already wanting to share my mortal life. I found Christ wanting to live in me. I'd been living as if the day of miracles had not yet come, as if revelations had ceased, as if God were dead or asleep, as if Christ were a fine china, locked away for a special occasion at the end of time. But this wasn't the case. Surprised by Christ, I've had to learn something new. I've had to learn what the Book of Mormon was trying to show. I've had to learn how to live right now as though Christ had already come. I've had to learn how to believe not just in continuing revelation, but in continuing redemption. I've had to learn to believe in what we might call an early resurrection. Thank you. be a little awkward in this space, but we have time for a, a few questions if you are interested. Um, and it'll be impossible for either of us to tell if you have one. <laughs> so uh, if, if you have a question, could you come maybe here, that's about as close as we or there, raise a hand and then Adam can respond. We've got about uh, seven to eight or eight minutes or so that we, you can ask if you'd like. Does anyone have questions? Yeah. Please, and, and speak up and Adam will restate the question for the audience. Is that okay? Surely. The question is, <laughs> uh, 
uh, her, her, her son finds church boring, if you can believe it. <laughs> and, <laughs> I don't know what your ward is like, but... Uh, and he thinks that he can, he can find happiness uh, without going through all the, all the trouble uh, of church. What can, what can we do about it? If that's God, let's take that call. <laughs> this, no? <laughs> well, it's pretty hot down there. It might be the other, might be the other end. <laughs> that's a good idea. We'll, we'll not take that one. Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, well, what can, what can we do with the perennial, it's the perennial question, right? What can we as, what can we as parents do? Uh, we certainly can't force people to it. It's not the kind of thing, it's not the kind of thing it is. Uh, even, if we're, even if we're in our power to force people to try after it, forcing them would, would never show them the thing they were looking for. In the end, the very thing that we're looking for is that willing relinquishment of our own lives. And that he has to come to on his own. I mean, you and I can attempt to exemplify the joy of what a life in Christ looks like. But everybody's got to sort it out for themselves. There's no cheating. There's no cutting the corners here. You can, I think, rest assured uh, that life will work relentlessly to disabuse him of the idea that he could be happy without it, that he could be happy owning his own life, making his life about him. Life will, at every turn, <laughs> uh, show him that's not the case. That's true for all of us. Uh, that will be hard, though. That all I got. You're welcome. A gesture of sympathy. I think we've got a, a question over here first. Yeah. Uh, so I really, really appreciate the idea that you, it's like what you were saying in Letters to the Young Mormon that you need to give up stories. Yeah. And that that's the uh, that's the that's the privileging stories over life is the root of sin. Yeah. But it it makes me wonder. Like, oftentimes I'm in a space where it's almost like I don't. I, I feel like I don't believe anything. Like, not even, it's almost like a pathological skepticism almost. Mm. To the point where I, I feel confused and, and, and isolated and scared of, in a world that doesn't make sense. What is the role of certainty in a Christian life? What is the role of certainty in a Christian life? Uh, especially in the face of the confusion and commotion of the world as it presents itself. To be good at philosophy, you have to be good at two things. You have to be good at abstraction, speaking in extraordinary generalities, uh, and you have to be good at doubt. I am in many respects a professional skeptic, honing for decades my capacity to, to be skeptical about things. It seems to me, it seems to me if I find myself in a place where I'm not sure exactly what to believe. That's a hard and difficult and, and dangerous place, but it's potentially a good place if, if in that moment of confusion and uncertainty, I relinquish my will to be in control of knowing what the story is. If in that moment I can place my confidence in the fact that the truth is going to be true regardless of whether I believed in it, then there's a kind of freedom in that that also allows me to connect in perhaps a deeper and more direct way with the truth than I would be able to if I were relying on my own stories and versions of that truth. But it's a hard, it's a hard and difficult place. Uh, and it's the kind of place uh, that everyone ends up at at some point as a result of the fact that life will relentlessly disabuse us of the fact 
that our own stories could work or be enough or, or capture what's really at stake. Uh, again, that's a kind of half, it's kind but of half it's true. measure, but it's true. I, I hope so. I, I think so, yeah. It seems true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what can we do? Wait, one or, what do you want, one or two more? Two more, Spencer, two more, Spencer Fulman says. This model of living in Christ, which I'm sure many of us share, the one that they remember, yeah. requires kind of like real-time management, like mm -hmm. being aware of every living second. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a temptation to relapse back into that old way of thinking. Perpetual. What do you do? I mean, prayer is a mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that we do, but is there a more instantaneous mechanism that keeps that in the forefront of your mind as you encounter all the circumstances of life that help you live this way? Uh, so the question is? The question is, what do you do to mm -hmm. maintain living in Christ instantaneously? Yeah, how do you stay, how do you remain in Christ in the present? Now given the, the perpetual the temptation to relapse into the Holy Spirit, hopefully fantasizing about the future. With you all the time, but most of us don't experience this continuously. Sure, sure. So, the presence of the Holy Ghost is manifest in the present. And you and I have to show up there. But that is, that is as you point out, hard work and perpetual, perpetual work. Um, in, in an important respect, it is, as you said, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a question about time management. Because as all of those church commercials encourage us to, to believe, uh, it is, of course, about time. Have you met um, people that have perfected or who, who practice it in a very advanced way? And, and that's obvious to you as you encounter intuition. Yeah, I think it, I think it can it can be very it's it's it can be super obvious when you bump into someone who's actually present, right? Someone who actually looks you in the eye and is there with you and doesn't have an agenda, and isn't already thinking about what comes next or or who else they they might be able to get something out of instead of whatever meager thing you're offering. Um, it I think prayer is a good name for that perpetual practice. Of, of putting my will down again and again and again, moment by moment, second by second, day by day, uh, learning how again to uh, surrender the fact that my life is not about me, even though relentlessly my mind spins that story. Uh, just believe it less and less, pray more and more, come alive <coughs> deeper and deeper. So, um, wanted to you know you talk about dying and living in Christ I'm going to just challenge on the first requirement of the philosopher so what does that actually look like you know so so I'm assuming you go to work you get a paycheck mm -hmm. you watch basketball games Indeed. you do things that everybody else does mm -hmm. what is it how does it actually look in practice um, when you're living a life of Christ you know, how does it feel different how does it look different then what we're all pretty much living. Yeah. How does it, so the question is, how does the life in Christ, how does it actually practically look or feel different from a life that's not in Christ? From the outside, it may or may not look very different, right? depending, on, depending on what your life already looks like. Uh, it may involve a kind of reformation of basic life choices that you're making in terms of ha how you spend your time or uh, the profession that you pursue or the goals that matter to you. Uh, or, you, you know, you may already be a decent human being, in which case uh, it may not look very different from the outside. Uh, but the difference, uh, I think we could say, as, as I mentioned in the talk, the, the difference uh, doesn't hinge straightforwardly on nouns or verbs. Uh, it hinges on the adverb. It hinges on, not straightforwardly, on what it is that I'm doing, but the way it is that I'm doing the thing that I'm doing. And the way that I'm, the manner in which I do it uh, may not be t super obvious from the outside that it's different from what someone else is doing, but what feels different about it, what, what feels different about it is that it feels, it feels alive. It feels alive. It feels like uh, instead of waiting for my life to start, it feels like I'm in it. It feels like I'm awake. It feels like I'm free. Uh, it feels like, uh, as Hugh Nibley put it here very dramatically, 
Uh, it feels like the limits of time have melted and fused. And that sounds very, that sounds very high-flown and mystical and philosophical, but it's a very common experience. It's a very common experience for you and I to be so selflessly absorbed in what we're doing that we lose track of ourselves and simultaneously lose track of time. Those two things go together. If I'm keeping track of time, you can be sure I'm keeping track of myself. If, however, I've lost track of myself and the thing that I'm doing is not about me, I will also lose track of time. And that, that loss of self and time is, I think, the kind of bare, fundamental, existential exposure to the presence of God. That's what it looks like, that's what it feels like. To eternity itself, right? Eternity, eternity shows up here, not as something that happens after time, but as this thing that wells up inside of time when we lose ourselves. Uh, and it feels good. It feels liberating. Uh, tastes like salt, the Buddha said. What's the ocean taste like? What's freedom taste like, he said? It tastes like the ocean, it tastes like salt. That's what it's like. Good question. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.